Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today for Heritage IRL, a 2020-2021 web series engaging Asian American heritage in real life across a range of media and communities. My name is Jason Oliver Chang. I'm Associate Professor of History and Asian American Studies at the University of Connecticut, where I also serve as Director for the Asian and Asian American Studies Institute. My work ranges from the history of Asian diasporas in Latin America to global maritime history, and most recently, the history of Connecticut tobacco plantations, partially inspired by Ocean Vong's novel, On Earth Were Briefly Gorgeous, which he spends formative years in, Hart in the Hartford area. So through the, through the Institute I direct, I bring activist and art practices into the research and teaching of Asian and Asian American studies. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here today. I'll be your host for this reading and the conversation with our esteemed guests. Uh, we are extremely fortunate to be joined by Monique Trung. She is based in Brooklyn, New York. She is a Vietnamese American novelist, essayist, libertist, former refugee, avid eater, and intellectual property attorney. She's, she says more or less in, it, it exists in that order. Uh, her novels are The Book of Salt, Bitter in the Mouth, and The Sweetest Fruit this excellent book here that we'll, we'll talk about and we'll hear from. She's the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, uh, American Academy of Arts and Letters Rosenthal Family Foundation Award, US Japan Creative Artists Fellowship, Penn Bingham Fellowship, Princeton's Universities, Princeton University's Hodder Fellowship, and New York Public Library's Young Lions Award, among many others. We also have with us the author of The Galleons, this beautiful book of poetry uh, by uh, uh, the author of The Galleons is Rick Barot, uh, who was born in the Philippines and grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. His work has appeared in numerous publications, including Poetry, The New Republic, Tin House, The Kenyan Review, and The New Yorker. He has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, National Endowment for the Arts. His fourth book of poems, The Galleons, which we'll hear from today, was published by Milkweed Editions earlier this year. The book is recently long listed for the National Book Award. I wanna remind everyone to find links for their work on, on this site. Um, and um, uh, so, so do check those out. Uh, today's program includes a reading by our guests from their recent books, followed by a discussion between the three of us. Uh, we'll then be turning to your questions, so please use the chat box to share them. And if you can wait to send those towards the end of our 15-minute discussion, we can be sure that we don't lose uh, your comments and questions at, you know, as they uh, are higher up in the text scroll. Uh, so another reminder, uh, to access the live captioning for this program, you'll have to click a link in the chat and I'll provide continuous reminders about that. Um, so uh, today's program is sponsored by the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, the Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage, the Smithsonian Anacostia Muse Community Museum, the Smithsonian Asian Pacific America Center, and the Association for Asian American Studies. I really wanna thank these, uh, these entities for their support and also for rescheduling our event that was supposed to take place earlier in the spring. Uh, this event was made possible through federal support from the Asia Pacific America Initiatives Pool administered by the Smithsonian Asia Pacific America Center. And now we'll begin with a reading by Monique. All right, the stage is yours, welcome. Hi. Thank you so much, Jason, for the introduction and for joining us tonight as our moderator. Um, I know Rick and I are just absolutely thrilled to have you um, with us. So I want to add to your list of thanks. Um, uh, I believe that Kundaman is also yes. one of our co-sponsors. Yes. Oh, thank so, you. Yeah, no worries. That that was a long list. <laughs> it takes a village to bring together <laughs> us all here. Um, so I um, I've actually never had the pleasure of meeting you, Jason or Rick, in person, and uh, I'm truly looking forward to the day when that's going to be possible again. Yes. And until then, we'll gather here. Uh, 
with you out there uh, in this nowhere and in this everywhere that is our community in exile for now. Tonight, I want to share with you an excerpt from my third novel. It's called The Sweetest Fruits. And it came out last year and it's now in paperback. It's a historical novel that's told from the point of view of four women who all played a significant role in the life of an author named Lafcadio Hearn. He's half Greek, half Irish, Japanese author who lived from 1850 to 1904. Taken together, the voices of these four women span the globe, which is apropos as Hearn himself circumnavigated the world in his brief 54 years of life. Today in the US, Hearn is remembered primarily for two things. One, that he is the author of what is considered the very first Creole cookbook to be published in the US, and that was in 1885. And two, as the um, an expert and cultural interpreter of Meiji era Japan to the West, focusing primarily on fairy tales, folklores, and ghost stories. Now in this excerpt, um, which comes from the very beginning of the novel, you're going to meet Rosa Casamati, his mother. The year is 1854 and she is on a ship on the Irish Sea. And she's sailing from Dublin back to one of the Ionian Islands off the western coast of Greece. And she has left Lafcadio behind. He's four years old. And she knows that she's never going to see him again. And here she is dictating a letter that is essentially the story story of her life to date. And she is hoping that one day Lafcadio will, will read this letter and understand uh, a bit about her and about why she chose to leave him behind. This is Rosa. Patricio Lafcadio Hearn was born hungry. I could tell by the way that he suckled. From the first time that his mouth found the nipple, he was not wont to let it go. His eyes opened and unblinking, watching and daring me to tug myself from him. All babies, were born with an empty stomach, but not all of them were born with such need in their eyes. His elder brother, Giorgio, my first blessed one, had to be coaxed and tricked. The tip of my little finger dipped in honey was what he took first into his rosebud mouth. Then, patiently, I would guide him to my breast where honey and milk would mix. This soothed him, but it was not enough to keep him. Giorgio shared my milk with Patricio for less than two months. I beg of you, do not call them George and Patrick. Those are not their names. Their father's language is not mine. Even before I was certain that there would be a blessed second, I suffered his appetite, which was growing in me swift and strong. Patricio demanded of me the small things from the sea, whelks, which no one sold because the people on Santa Maura, same as on Sarago, the island where I was born, 
would not buy something that they could gather like pebbles at the shore. In the morning, I would leave my first with old Iota, the only woman on our lane with no children of her own, in order to bend over the wet sand until I felt lightheaded or until my basket was full. Patricia wanted the whelks boiled, their spiral of flesh removed one by one. He allowed me olive oil and lemon juice with them, but never vinegar. When there was no longer a doubt and whelks became too difficult for me to collect, Patricio insisted on cockles, of which there were sellers, because cockles were found on the sandbars far from shore where the tide came in like the hand of God. To lose your life for mere cockles is a curse as old as the sea. And may you never hear it spoken. Like his father, Patricio disliked garlic. He purged me of all foods, even the favored cockles, if they took on its flavor. I would whisper to him that these cloves were like the pearls of the land, holding them close to my swollen belly so that he could become accustomed to their scent. But he was not to be convinced. He emptied and emptied me again until I was starving. I soon gave up on the hope of garlic and steamed the cockles open with a sliver of shallot instead. Patricio could not get enough of those briny creatures. It took buckets of them to fill us. During the last months when we were one, Patricio confined us to sea urchins, their egg yolk bodies scooped onto chunks of bread. Every day to make sure that we had enough, old Iota had to pay four boys to wade into the shallows at low tides, where these spiny orbs darken the water like the shadows of gulls flying overhead. Fatten on this fair, Day in and day out, I took on such weight that I could take only a few steps around the bed, an animal tied to a stake. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. That was stunning. I have I have goosebumps because I always love hearing. The, you know, from the author, uh, the, these readings are so magical. Thank you. Um, now we turn to to Rick for a reading from the Galleons. Uh, thank you for joining us, Rick. Yeah. Okay, take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Jason, and uh, good evening to uh, everyone. I'm really grateful uh, to all of you for being here and also grateful to all the organizations that sponsored this event. Um, I'm especially thankful to Lawrence Mann Davis for inviting me to participate in this event. And really what an honor to be reading with Monique Trong. So thank you for that beautiful reading, Monique. Um, it seems to me that any chance uh, to be together, especially during this moment of ongoing crisis seems not only um, wanted, but also required. So it's good to be here with all of you tonight. So I'm going to read, uh, uh, I'm going to begin by reading a couple of poems from the Galleons. And I'm gonna just launch right in. The, the, first, the first poem that I'm going to read is uh, a poem called The Girl Carrying a Ladder. And I don't think I need to say anything about it beforehand, except that I, I drag Louis Vuitton into this poem. 
the girl carrying a ladder. On the same day, I read about the luxury goods company that has produced a punching bag you can buy for $175,000. I see the photograph of the Palestinian girl who carries a ladder with her each morning when she goes to school. To scale the wall of my own understanding of why a punching bag would cost so much, I have to think about why I'm attracted to that punching bag the way some people are attracted to pink kittens or the way some people are attracted to camouflage or the way some people are attracted to their gods. I want that punching bag the way the girl carrying the ladder wants to go to school, relentless, single-minded, and absurd. Carrying the ladder that is twice or three times as tall as she is, leaning the ladder against the wall that separates her from her school, the girl goes up the ladder as though it were something she did every day, which in fact she does. When I think of a punching bag, I think of sex. When I think of a ladder, I think of picking apples. When I think of the girl carrying the ladder to go to school, I think of the neighborhood girls carrying pink camouflage backpacks, not knowing about the armies that the camouflage stands for. The logo of the luxury brand is printed all over that punching bag, the way camouflage is all over us. Camouflage bed sheets, camouflage cell phone covers, camouflage shirts in neon colors that everyone wears, even the people who vote against guns. We live in paradox and we prosper. We live in paradox and we thrive. What I can't figure out is how the girl deals with the barbed wire at the top of the wall she has to go over or what her ladder weighs or what she does with the ladder when she gets to school. Does she put it against a wall with the other ladders, the way kids put their bikes in bike racks at school? What I can't figure out is why two men who look like gods would want to break down the wall of each other's faces, knowing there's only blood on the other side, or why apples are the fruit children bring to their teachers and why it isn't coconuts or grapefruit, or why the neighborhood girls on their way to school each morning carry backpacks that are so heavy, it looks like they are carrying the world. So the, the title poem for my book, The Galleons, is comprised of 10 poems, which are scattered throughout the book. And I'm going to read the final poem from the sequence. As, uh, as Jason mentioned earlier, I was born in the Philippines and we immigrated to the United States when I was 10. So this, this poem has uh, my Filipino heritage and childhood uh, in the Philippines as the context for this poem. This is The Galleon's 10. I come from the lowlands. My mother's city was built on the river where the mountains fanned out to the sea and the city thrived there. I come from farmers. I come from childhood's green radio, from the Kalachuchi tree and its white flowers. I come from prayer. My parents took me to a faith healer once though no one now recalls the malady or the terms of the cure. I had a fate. It took me across an ocean. It has taken half a life to turn back and see what it was I left behind. I come from teachers and soldiers. On the island where my father comes from, the people covered their bodies with tattoos. I come from soot, from ink. I come from people who honed their teeth to sharp points, who buried their dead in coffins 
shaped like boats for a journey. I come from horizon. I come from water. So those are two poems from the Galleons. I'm going to finish my reading by reading a, a handful of poems from a chapbook that was published in September. And I'm gonna flash the chapbook here. It was uh, published by Albion Books. And there are 30 short prose poems in the chapbook. And the chapbook is titled During the Pandemic. And I'll mention that each poem begins with the phrase during the pandemic. So that's an indication of when I'm reading a new poem. So I'll just read a, a handful of these to wrap up. Thank you all very much for listening. During the pandemic, I fixed on each fear. Each fear was its own fastidiousness. My mother and the ocean, not even a touch of it, not even her feet in the tender edge of surf, my friend and the tunnels he went through with his eyes closed. When we went outside, we wore latex gloves, the colors of Easter. We stood apart in the mandated distance, like the last pieces at the end of a game of chess. During the pandemic, I kept a list of possible symptoms on the refrigerator door. From a distance, it looked like a shopping list, an ersatz normalcy. Fever instead of flour, cough instead of bacon, fatigue instead of milk. With each day, the slippages proliferated, hospital instead of hospitality, projections instead of protections, virus instead of virtue. Asymptomatic veered towards asymptote, an intimate infinity between them. During the pandemic, I thought of scale. Pandemics, I read, had shaped human history from the very start, like lava scorching an old landscape with regularity. That was one kind of scale. The tweet from the man announcing his wife's death from the virus, this was another kind of scale. Soft, the size of my face, the mask I wore to the store was one kind of scale. The racist violence being done to people who looked like me was another kind of scale. The poem is the speech of citizenship, a scholar wrote, and I laughed. During the pandemic, I praised the cherry blossoms. I praised my lungs. I praised crying. I praised the faces of my students checkerboarded on the computer screen. I praised the curses I gave to those who deserve them. I praised coffee. I praised ventilators. I praised the people gathered on the rooftop of a neighbor of a neighborhood building, laughing as they looked up at the night sky. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. I'm, I'm so glad that you read Galleons 10. Uh, that is one of my, my favorite in, in, I mean, there are so many wonderful, um, things to focus on in your book. And I read that one several times in a row. Um, so thank you for reading that the, and, and also sharing your new work. This is, um, I think uh, everyone can identify with, with the, as you call the slippages. Um, this, that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I, I'd like to uh, bring Monique in uh, to the conversation and uh, yeah, thank you. And so um, I, I'm, I have a timer for myself. Let me set this timer um, so we we can sit, make sure we save our time for uh, the audience too. Um, and um, gosh, I mean, we could talk, we could go in a number of directions, but I mean, I feel like 
I want to be a little bit selfish as a historian and um, and kind of talk to you a little bit about that because I'm interested in the process that you all both of you go through from idea to research however you do that it, you know wouldn't have to be any specific kind and then into writing because uh, there's there's so much I, I identified with in both of your works um, and so as a historian I've come to expect to leave the archives hungry uh, and um, and so there's a way that you know the your interpretive mind and your imaginative you know connections uh, you know draw out the meaning from what what is around you or what you've sought out. Um, and so I, I just wanted to share a little story to kind of ask a you know to get a little bit into the question. Um, and so in my training as a historian, I came across the concept of saturation, which mm -hmm. um, is where where you're supposed to achieve a level of knowledge about the record collection, where uh, you know are, you're no longer surprised by what you find, and um, and I think for historians doing research on well documented populations or famous individuals, I could see how you could come to the concept of saturation. Um, yeah, I could see how that would emerge, but I I found the exact opposite. Um, the archive. Um, is also a record of power. And uh, the people we need to learn from it in the past do not leave the same traces or abundance of evidence. Um, so one you know, really awesome technique I learned from John Jarity uh, while at Cal was to, you know, he, he asked us to imagine our ideal archival source, whether it's a diary, a picture, a letter, um, and now erase the possibility of finding that source. And then the trick came in imagining all the other forms of evidence that could be in orbit of that ideal source and then track down those leads. Um, and I sensed a similar method that might be at work um, in your own processes and especially with Rick's line and, and Galleons 5, um, what I actually need to know, I would have to conjure myself. Um, you know, that I, I saw, I was like, wow, that's a beautiful, you know, uh, you know capturing of that that moment um, that uh, for me, it's kind of an archive feeling. Um, and Monique, I felt that, that this, this might just be your MO as you conjure intimate lives uh, back into existence. Um, so, you know, could you share about your process and if you've ever tried to hunt for evidence that never appeared and what that taught you? Mm. Wow, Jason, that's, that's such a perfect place to begin. Um, because I felt the engagement of uh, the Galleons Rick's collection with the archive so deeply as I was reading it. And uh, certainly, you know, um, there are so many places where I can begin to to sort of respond to your question here. But let's uh, let's affirm the fact that, yes, you know, the uh, the archive is a record of power. Um, and in that sense, the, the main character of my novel, Lafcadio Hearn, is well documented in the archive, right? Um, he, uh, he left behind over 20 some books. He's had many in-depth biographies written about him. He's, uh, he was an incredible correspondent uh, during his lifetime. And so those letters have been published as well. I mean, you could not ask for, you know, a richer source, right? He was a great man of letters in that sense, you know. <laughs> um, but I wasn't really interested in him. <laughs> I was interested in the women around him. And that th those um, women, their lives were not documented in the same way. Um, let's let's just take a look at um, his. Um, I should probably backtrack and just say that the the women. There are four voices, but I only wrote three of the voices. Uh, the fourth voice is actually the voice of his. Uh, first biographer, a woman, a dear friend of his. So she left behind 
clearly something in the archives, right, of herself and of Hearn. Now, the first voice that I dealt was with his, his mother, who was, did not have access to the written word, right? And his first wife also did not have access to the written word. And I, I say that very deliberately um, because, I, because I do not think that the term illiterate truly captures their status and their state of being. Um, and then there is the voice of his second wife. Um, and she did have access to Japanese, but her work um, was published in Japan, a memoir of her life with him, but it was translated into English uh, a very poor translation, apparently. Um, so what I know of her, because I do not have Japanese, uh, was it, it felt uh, stunted and simplified. And I, and um, so there you go. You, uh, I didn't have to. I mean, if we follow uh, your mentor's, uh, you know, uh, formula, imagine the ideal, you know, resources. Love Kyle Hearn, you know, had all that around him. And then you, you just take away everything, essentially, you know, especially for his mother and his first wife, Alethea Foley, who was born an enslaved woman, uh, who was an enslaved woman. Um, and um, so what do you have left? <laughs> you have a secondhand account of them. You know, and um, like I said, we could go on, I could go on forever about this, but I, I just want to give you one very concrete example with, mm -hmm. let's say, Alethea Foley, right? With Alethea Foley, I had two things to sort of piece together her voice. One was the fact that Hearn himself wrote a, an article that purported to be her telling him ghost stories. And that was published in a Cincinnati newspaper. And he, he is writing, quote unquote, in her voice, right? Um, so that was one. Two, there was an interview that she gave to a Cincinnati newspaper reporter towards the end of her life. And she, there again, you have, uh, a purported representation of her voice. But as we know, when we are having an interview, especially with a newspaper reporter, he or she can take uh, down what they'd like or ignore what they'd like. So there again, there were the gaps that I had to imagine. Um, so, um, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I want to turn this over to Rick because I I am... <laughs> I, like I said, I, I could go on forever, but I want to hear Rick. So please. Well, I was just thinking that I love listening to a novelist talk about the, the work that they do with that act of imaginative recovery. Um, I was almost thinking that what you described is almost like Midrash, where you know there's a received text but on the margins or you know, in the corners of the received text, there are presences that are barely there, traces, residues of other consciousness, other lives. And part of what you're doing in this novel, and you certainly did that with the Book of Salt as well, is to kind of center the, the, you know, the kind of the marginal or the residual kind of traces of those presences uh, on the margins. And I really love listening to novelists talk about that. And especially, you know, given your work where, you know, the, the kind of the Midrash project turns into this incredible kind of imaginative apparatus. Um, on the other hand, <laughs> being the poet, um, I, I was uh, having a conversation one time with the wonderful poet Jane Wong about what it means to research as a poet. And I made the offhand analogy that seems to me still very uh, true that 
for a poet, uh, research is sort of like going to Goodwill on a Saturday afternoon and picking up sort of odd bits and, and pieces and being attracted um, in a kind of instinctual way to some kind of res residual aura that those objects or things carry. And the work of the poem is a kind of, um, you know, uh, a kind of a dreaming, uh, the kind of the entity that that object belonged to or that that object uh, is from. Um, in terms of the galleons, um, I will say that uh, I did a lot of re research for the book. Um, I, I read a lot of uh, books, online uh, research. I had the fortune of having a Guggenheim, so I did a lot of traveling. I actually went to Spain, I went to the Philippines, I looked at archives and museums. But I, I, I kind of, I observed a goodwill shopping principle when I was doing all of those things in the sense that I was not methodically uh, saturating myself. I was noticing what I noticed, meaning that these offhand images or information, those are the things I would write down. I did not feel responsible for the kind of the, the, the full story. I wanted to be responsible for the offhand, the anecdotal, the incidental. Uh, and that to me was the scale that uh, as a poet, I felt uh, really kind of um, charged with. So that's what the galleons is really about. It's there's a lot of work behind it, but you know a lot of that work um, sort of you know fell away for the the smaller things that the poems end up preserving. Oh, that's fantastic! Yeah, thank you guys for sharing. That was uh, that's wonderful, um, and I also like. Uh, the image of thinking about you kind of going through the archives like a like a goodwill. Um, that's that's awesome. Um, so uh, there's a couple minutes left in this in this portion. So I want to invite our uh, attendees and the audience to to drop your questions in the comments. Um, and so while we um, while we uh, uh, put that in queue, I wanted to kind of follow up. Um, and there's some threads here that I think are, are uh, that can connect. Um, I, I think another you know common dimension you know, maybe across is that there's absence um, in the material archive, but there's also absence in our collective historical imagination, even you know of ourselves in history. And um, your works you know speak to these problems with like grace and and humanity um, and. And so, you know, I, I, I connected with that um, in my own work, trying to, uh, um, trying to write histories of Chinese, Filipino and South Asian Muslim sailors uh, who worked on imperial fleets and left so few records. Um, uh, but we know more about the cargo than we do about these the sailors. Um, and then I also keep with me uh, this conversation I had with my, my grandma Chang, who, um, after I asked her about her life and memories of growing up in Hanapepe, Kauai and working in a pineapple can cannery, she replied that she honestly felt her story was not important and not worth retelling. And that broke my heart. And, um, and so, you know, even, you know, there's like, there's, there's the, the absence in the archive, there's absence in our collective memory. And then if, if, even if we feel absent from from history ourselves, um, that those those things have have all um, kind of resonated with me, and I, I'm pulling here from from the chat. Um, for Monique, from a creativity standpoint, is there a difference between writing a novel that is based on factual historical events, very different from your first two novels? Is there less writer's block, or if there's block, is it a different kind of type, different type of Hmm. Well, I can tell you one thing that's similar uh, across all three novels is that <laughs> they took me a really long time to write. <laughs> and I think that's, that's really about the way that my mind works, which is it takes a really long time to, to process information. Um, 
in in terms of the historical novel, um, I actually think all three of my novels are historical novels, um, different mm -hmm. time frames, you know. But um, yeah, the, um, I think um, one of the things that I try to do is to use the facts that I have found as sort of the um, the sort of uh, framework for the story. I never change those facts. Um, and so in that sense, you you come to the story with with certain things, uh, certain places, certain, you know, sort of uh, uh, context in terms of history, all of that. Those things are in place. But how you connect uh, fact A with fact B with fact C uh, is up to me, right? And so, and those, and I always say that is the spaces between and among the facts that is where I work. And so that's where the imagination and, and the um, creativity comes in. And with all acts of creativity and imagination, there are points where uh, they won't connect, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, so in that sense, uh, uh, each one of them, uh, you know, feels strangely the same in terms of process. Yeah, which is, it's torture. <laughs> um, but, but I can't let them go once I'm, I'm in it, you know. Can I ask mm -hmm. a follow-up question, Jason? Yes, to please. Monique. Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking that for, for a poet, um, a poet is only ever responsible for kind of embodying their own physicality and their own mind and experience. But for a fiction writer or a novelist, you you have to embody other bodies, other minds. And so I'm wondering what what is that work like? You know, you have these women in the in your new novel who are very different from each other. So how do you how do you kind of be them? while you're writing their stories because poets don't have to you know uh, don't have that burden um well i i think the first thing i do is that i i try to inhabit their language mm -hmm. does that make sense mm -hmm. i mean mm -hmm. because i prefer to write in the first person voice that's where i begin and when I can sort of imagine how they sound or what, you know, maybe their verbal tics or their, the, the scope of their vocabulary or their, their metaphorical languages, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Once I can get there, then I think about the body. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, that might be, you know, backwards but but that's that's how i i approach it i, I have a follow-up question for <laughs> for rick if that's okay Jim. yes please, please okay um and i i had tweeted about this because th there's a line rick in galleons 2 that is haunting me which is the very first line and you wrote research is mourning my friend says mm -hmm. period right yeah. And first, I really do want to know who is this friend, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and why are they so wise? <laughs> <laughs> and and two, do you do you think of research in that way? And do you ever think about research as a form of trauma? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the first question is is a pleasure to answer because that 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 line research is morning is a distillation of an idea uh, from the fabulous poet and a good friend of mine Brian Tier. Um, he was giving a talk at AWP, I believe, on uh, uh, some research that he had been doing into nineteenth-century spirit photographs. He was really interested in that for a while. He was doing a lot of archival work in New England, looking at these, you know, these manipulated photographs that looked like there were ghosts uh, in them. And so that notion that he had of, you know, research as being uh, a kind of uh, a kind of haunting, a kind of mourning for people 
you know, who who kept wishing for their dead loved ones to return. Mm -hmm. And so that notion really stuck with me when I heard him talk about that and the spirit photographs. Um, in, ter in terms of, you know, my own sense of research, uh, it, it has to be uh, mourning because there are so many absences there, as you and Jason have pointed out, that, you know, the, the archive only um, sort of values uh, specific objects or stories or, you know, information about specific people. And so you have to kind of like, you know, tease out what you can in the archives of the people who were fully present uh, and yet not recorded or not, you know, considered valuable enough to be included. Um, last night I was, uh, I was doing another event and uh, Paisley Rechdahl was the, um, the, the, the moderator and Paisley right now is engaged in uh, a very long poetry project about the, the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. And, you know, as we all know, that, that, that railroad was, was built by Chinese. And yet all of the kind of photographic record of that endeavor, there's not a, you know, a single Chinese, uh, you know, worker pictured there. So that's an interesting kind of way of thinking about, you know, researching that moment of American history and literally seeing that the archive is one of, you know, loss and erasure. And in that regard, research has to be a kind of mourning, even as it is also um, tasked with, you know, reclaiming and rebuilding and refiguring what's missing. Does that answer your question, Monique? It does, and I, and it occurs to me, if it's okay, Jason, I'd, I'd like to hear your take on it. Yeah. Yeah, mourning and trauma. Yeah, um, I mean, my, my first book was about anti-Chinese politics in Mexico, and um, and so I, I, I went hunting for, for the mourning. Yeah, I, you know, I went, because in, you know, in, in so many histories of, of the Mexican Revolution and of Mexico, the, the, the Chinese are absent. Uh, and it's become a kind of, you know, expectation that, you know, and so when, uh, when I would tell people that I'm researching Chinese in Mexico, they would kind of giggle or laugh like, wow, you know, I had no idea. And I think that just speaks to the power of the erasure. Um, and um, and so when I did find things, you know, it um, it struck me that um, that these were, you know, that th these weren't just isolated incidences; that they were uh, a part of a genealogy of violence. And and as I as I started, you know, looking at the patterns of violence towards the Chinese, I realized that they were embedded in larger structures. And so, for instance, the um, the hanging of Chinese men in the northern part of Mexico, um, you know, that um, that that had connections to the anti-Indian campaigns um, against the Yaqui and the Apache. Um, and so, like, there are, you know, I, it made me think of violence as a form of communication, and uh, and that there were practices of violence that were they were practicing communicating to an audience to themselves uh, and that and that this was something that um, and when I started thinking about it like that it put um, um, I started looking for different kinds of sources and and then you start seeing the violence everywhere and um, and that that that's hard to deal with but I put it you know in the context that that this is the story that I want to tell um, and because it's, it is, you know, it's been, um, it's been ignored. And, uh, and so, you know, for a while I felt like, um, I did not want to write those histories, uh, or that, you know, if, if another historian had cited a case, um, that, that was enough. Okay. It's in the, it's in the record. We know about it. Um, I don't need to repeat it. Uh, but then after a while it was about, you know, you know, engaging the record itself. Um, and so, 
um, I, I, I really appreciate your guys' meditation on this because I, um, I think, you know, uh, the, the more that, that we connect our own, you know, uh, our, our, our work in remembering uh, to, you know, as a part of humanity, uh, we expand, you know, those, those possibilities of feeling um, and 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 make that a part of part of our lives. Um, so that, mm. that that's really wonderful. Um, even as as it's painful. Um, but there there are um, there's some other other questions that um, I want to turn to from from our audience. One is uh, for Rick, or there's there's two for Rick actually, um, and maybe we can combine them. Uh, so this is. Um, this is from a novelist who's asking about the, uh, the the sort of efficiency and precision of of language as a poet, um, and I live with a poet, so um, there, yeah. we're always um, uh, parsing words, and she picks out phrases from my uh, from <laughs> from my uh, uh, from our conversations that just become little hooks um, and and things. So um, I definitely get that 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 question about uh, precision. Um, and then another uh, another one here. Uh, what advice do you have for poets begin beginning research endeavors to cultivate trust in the offhand, to trust the nonlinear associative journey of the goodwill brow goodwill browsing? Is it possible to fully trust this process? I, I think that as a poet, you 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 have to in a way because you know the, the matrix of uh, of your own subjectivity is going to make you understand. Or discover what's important in all of these objects or information or images that you have uh, gathered, um, and then you you write the poem to discover what the resonances are among these different things that you have sort of um, you know paid attention to. So um, I, I don't know. I mean, I I, I feel so kind of. Uh, uh, lackadaisical as a poet <laughs> in the sense that uh, so much of the the kind of fuel for what I do is a kind of dreaming. Um, you know, you latch onto a phrase or an image or an idea, and then you sort of, you know, put it into some corner of your mind where it kind of grows somehow like, you know, like a fungus. <laughs> and then, <laughs> And then eventually, it it you know announces itself as uh, as a poem. Um, I guess for me these days, maybe just to extend uh, my answer past the question a little bit, is that um, uh, I'm interested now in kind of gathering all kinds of images into my mind and creating a space in the poem where all sorts of disparate or seemingly contradictory things can exist. And um, I think there's something actually kind of ethical about you know creating that kind of space where seemingly incommensurate things are jostling with each other, <clears throat> not just in my consciousness, but also you know in 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 the way that I see the world. Um, and frankly, I learned a little bit of this from uh, Elizabeth Bishop, who's who's got a very clear. Uh, I for you know the whole world. Her her poems are very interesting in the sense that the 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 environment, the the peoples that she writes about, uh, the creatures that she writes about. There's a kind of a an, a an ethically level field there. The human is never just prioritized as the foreground, mm -hmm. and so I I learned that from her, which is a very strange source to be learning about you know how to conduct uh, yourself as an ethical sort of, uh, you know, having an ethical vision when you're a poet, having an ethical perspective when it comes to the images that you, that you gather. But that's something that I'm interested in these days in my poems. What does it mean to create spaces wherein teeming amounts of different energies uh, can kind of coexist and be in tension with each other but also create, you know, music and pleasure uh, and harmony for the reader somehow. So I don't know if I answered that question, uh, mm -hmm. but that that's where it led to in my thinking just just now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that does that resonate with you, Monique? Um, it does in this sense. Well, one, I have to say that I have great 
respect for Rick and anyone out there who's able to write <laughs> at this <laughs> moment in time. Um, when you were reading Rick from your chapbook, I I just thought I yes yes I recognize this I see it I I can and yet I could not have been able I have not been able to sort of put um, my experience into words. So thank you for that form of documentation for us. Mm -hmm. um, I think about, the, I, I am so intrigued by this idea of this, this sort of egalitarian space within a poem mm -hmm. that you speak of. And I, I don't know if um, I could, I'm not, I don't think I am uh, trying towards that, but I am trying to work with this past novel towards something that I felt was, you know, a narrative space where disparate um, women, um, a, a Greek woman um, and a black woman from the United States who had, you know, been born into slavery, a Japanese woman, that their voices can sort of uh, exist in the same narrative space um, because of this man who, like I said, honestly does not interest me that much, except for the fact that because of him, I was introduced and have fragments of these women's lives. Mm. Um, and, and uh, you know, now when I think back on this book, I think back on it because it, like I said, it took me so long to write it. You know, I began it in 2010, 2010, during the Obama <laughs> administration. Think of where my headspace was, you know? <laughs> like the, it was of hope and possibilities. And, and you know, I, I didn't think we were at a post-racial moment or anything like that, but I did think that we were at a moment in this country of being able to, and I use this word very pointedly and I understand the weight of it, that we could breathe, you know, mm -hmm. that we could all just let our shoulders down a little bit and take a mm -hmm. deep breath. And when I say we, I mean different, um, you know, people of color, you know, that we as, or, as, as communities could, could say to one another, Hello, <laughs> you know, we share history. Let's start to talk about this, this, this that we have together. And, and by the time this book came out, 2019, it felt that was an impossibility. It felt like a mm -hmm. fool's errand to have written this novel. My <laughs> God, <laughs> What's the, what is the takeaway here? Write quicker. <laughs> <laughs> because you know we we are all beings in a in a particular moment and time you know mm -hmm. and and who 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 knew that we would all end up here you know mm -hmm. in 2020 in a pandemic talking to each other like this you know and and the word hope seems so far away and the word breathe is politicized mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'm just thinking too about how um, you know uh, American literature, especially that 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 that's being written by writers of color prior to Trump. Um, we were writing finally. I felt we were writing finally into a space that was uh, kind of salutary, that was generous, that was robustly sort of like um, kind of like you know, embracing the productions that we were uh, kind of putting out into the world, the literary world. And then something in, when, when, when Trump came into the scene, the, the kind of the context for that literature suddenly changed overnight, that suddenly all of this work wasn't just kind of coming out of a salutary co context, but one that was deeply political 
and uh, you know engaged in resistance. So the the kind of the 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 beautiful context that I had been operating under for 15 years in my life as a poet was suddenly um, dismantled, and suddenly all the work that I was doing uh, had a very different utility um, in terms of the the social uh, and the cultural and the political. So that was interesting to me that you know that that immediate shift uh, overnight that the work that we were doing wasn't just sort of like you know this wonderful thing anymore, but in fact it was you know it was it was like being at the you know at the barricades in a way. It was reconfigured overnight. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, Necessarily so, right? Mm -hmm. Necessarily mm -hmm. so, and yeah. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, uh, I'm, I wanted I wanted to uh, take this time to thank you both. We have run out of time, unfortunately, and I have. I have so much more that I want to talk to you guys about. <laughs> um, and but this has been so wonderful and heartwarming and and just to, to be able to dive into your text and hear you read and and to share these thoughts have just been uh, been tremendous. So uh, so th thank you everyone um, and and to our audience, thank you for tuning in and um, and checking us out. Um, have a good evening, everyone.